This is not just about uh, fighting a terrible proposal. This is something that we can come, come together around with, with great joy and inspiration and, and push for this. And sometimes where you know, the, the, the seemingly invincible fortress looks invincible the moment before it collapses, uh, we could be closer than we think to, to accomplishing something like that. The central role that highways um, play in fighting climate change, in creating more housing, in making cities more beautiful, more walkable, more bikeable. This is a fight we have to fight. All right, look at you two. Woohoo! Woo! Yay! Hey everybody, this is John with the Active Towns channel, and I have something really special for us here today, along with the horns of the trucks. <laughs> I have Adam and Kelsey here with me, and we are at the convention center in the downtown station. Say hi, you two. Hi, everyone. Hey. <laughs> uh, why don't I have you both uh, introduce yourselves real quickly, and then we'll go from there. Uh, Kelsey, let's start with you. I'm Kelsey Hughes. I've been in Austin for about five years and I've been a part of Rethink 35 for about two years, I think. Fantastic. And I'm Adam Greenfield. I'm also with Rethink 35 and I've been involved with this freeway fighting Rethink 35 thing for about three years. Fantastic. That's great. And, uh, and we're going to do something rather fun and special. Come on, get in here, Kelsey. We'll try to get us all in here. Yeah, that, there we go. <laughs> we're going to go out for a little bit of a bike ride and we're going to go look at uh, I-35. Uh, again, as I mentioned, we are right here at the, um, the downtown, the central station for the light rail system. You can see a bunch of people getting off. And this is also the location of the 4th Street Bikeway, which you can see right here and the convention center. And then right off in the distance, you might be able to see the the car moving along i-35 and there's some pretty significant things that we're going to see when we go over there we're going to go to a couple of different locations uh and, and just talk a little bit about the impacts of what this challenge is uh real quickly adam tell us about rethink i-35 well rethink 35 started to you know first of all question the, uh, the existence of I-35 through Austin. Um, it's been referred to as one of the greatest mistakes in our city's history. Um, but we've known for a long time that the Texas Department of Transportation or TxDOT wants to expand this highway. And we, we really wanted to call out, uh, call out that out because this is, this is a failed uh, transportation policy. We've seen time and time again that widening highways doesn't work. And uh, there are alternatives, and we, we are here to you know give those alternatives uh, the light of day that they need. Yeah, yeah. And Kelsey, what inspired you to get involved with this particular initiative? First, I saw the documentary Segregated by Design, which is a 20 minute documentary, and it features Austin a little bit. And it's about housing and transit. And then I read The Color of Law, and I learned that interstate highways do not have to go through the center of cities of downtowns and they were used as a racial dividing line and then i just immediately wanted to fix the problem fantastic now kelsey this isn't your day job either no <laughs> no i uh i actually work right across here so we'll take the route on fourth street this is how i go to work um, but i'm a software engineer by day yeah fantastic so you're one of the many volunteers that are out there. Uh, Adam, before we uh, head over to I-35, just uh, talk a little bit about this uh, as an initiative from, uh, because this is a community-led uh, initiative and it's, and it's really pretty much volunteers that are making this happen. Talk a little bit about that. This is a passion project. I think people really just understand the importance of this and the generational impact of this, of this project. And uh, it's just amazing, you know, every, every month, we have new people come on board with, with new skills, new contributions, and it's really the, the bonds between us um, and the, the, the truth of, of the campaign that, that keeps people together and keeps people going. And it's, at this point, it's really a, a, a big family, and uh, it's amazing what big families can accomplish. All right, let's go check out this monster. <laughs> okay. Okay. All right. okay, we are now rolling uh, towards I-35, right past the downtown transit station here. There's Kelsey, there's Adam. Swing around here so we can actually see. 
And that was a pretty good crowd of folks. As you saw getting off of the train this morning, it was rather nice to see. So Kelsey, talk a little bit about this route and how important this is for you to have this particular facility. This route is one of the only ones I feel completely safe on in Austin. And it brings me so much joy. I just have fun. I don't have to worry about cars. And a lot of the times I see people I know on the route. So it's really fun to just run into people. Yeah. But yeah, this is how I go to work. So I have a pretty much direct shot right off of the trail. And uh, yeah, I feel really lucky about that. Kelsey, I want to know what you think about this crossing right here. I get angry at TechStot every time I'm at this crossing because there's no beg button. So it makes a crossing the worst possible scenario because you have frontage road traffic. Oh God, yeah. See, people don't use their turn signals here. Yeah. So you never know if they're turning under or going straight. I've thought often if we could sue TechStot for this crossing because what are you supposed to do if you can't see? Because I, I have a friend who takes the train. Um, they have very low visibility in their eyes. And I don't think they can cross this alone. Wow. So this is just like an impossible... Yeah. Yeah. It's very high speed traffic. And so I think part of the expansion plan is getting the frontage road to 35 miles an hour. Is that true? But people aren't going to drive that, in my opinion. I mean, I think like the fact that TechStop still allows this to happen you know, it is really a sign of where that agency is at in, in the capital of Texas, in one of the most major crossings that, that they would allow this situation to happen in the year 2023. I think we should read a lot into that. Look at this. Especially visitors from elsewhere, when they, when they come here, they, they just can't believe that this crossing exists like this. Yeah. They, they just, it doesn't make sense to them. Okay, Kelsey, we, uh, we, we just talked a little bit as we were rolling through this particular uh, really intersection yeah. with IH-35, and we have to get across the... Um... This is perfect, actually. Yeah. Because when the train comes by, yeah. then you know it's safe to cross. Right. And it's so fun when you can cross with the train. Yeah. Because the cars have to stop. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So what Kelsey just said there, in case you, you couldn't hear it, uh, is, you know, from the bells there, is that, you know, when that happens, it makes it safer for you to cross. And yes. so you exactly, you see that is we've got our pedestrians being able to make it across this intersection. We've got the, the few cars, you know, sort of queued up. And you'll notice that traffic really isn't that insane. And, you know, we're, we're, what we're really talking about here is trying to make these types of barriers you know, much easier to get across. It's amazing, yeah. you know? Okay, so, but what's gonna happen in the future? What's gonna happen for you, for your ability to get through here if this goes through a major remodel? Well, first of all, it's going to change from two lanes on this side, two lanes on that side, to six lanes on this side. So it's what TechStot is calling a boulevard, it's going to be high speed traffic that is just getting in and off the interstate. Right. So we'll have to cross all six lanes at once. I recently moved off of South Lamar Boulevard, which is a five lane, 35 mile per hour road, which is what they were envisioning for the frontage roads here. I do not feel safe near it at all. Yeah. So I am a little bit scared of what's yeah. going to happen. Yeah. Yeah. So they're using that term uh, boulevard uh, uh, there, Adam. Uh, what's your uh, commentary on uh, that as a boulevard? Don't get me started on, on Techstart's boulevard design. Uh, they are clearly hijacking the term boulevard to use it for something that is, uh, that is nothing like a boulevard. It, it really is not. A, a, a boulevard is a place where things happen. 
uh, where there are destinations on each side. This thing is, a, is just a six lane concrete uh, slaughter lane uh, go, going th would go through the center of Austin. So um, yeah, it's, it's, it's terrible. It's, it's terrible. This really is uh, uh, a 1950s era mentality trying to masquerade as a 21st century uh, uh, traffic solution and it's, it's nothing of the kind. Now, Kelsey, I mean, obviously, you know, it's one thing of what the, the final vision might be, but it's, it's totally another thing about uh, what your life will be like during construction. Talk a little bit about that. I think that's a big unknown. Um, what we do know is it's going to be noisy. Um, it's going to be chaotic. That's about it. Who knows what this is going to be like when they're tearing it up? Will I have to use a different crossing? This is honestly the only one I feel safe at. I may have to switch and use one much farther north. I'm not sure. Have you heard anything, Adam? Do you have anything to add to that? TechStart doesn't tell us a lot of things. Yeah. Uh, you know, that this, they are, they say they want to build, uh, they want to dig a, a ditch right here, put the highway in the ditch. Uh, I just find that incredibly depressing, uh, no pun intended, that, that, that Techstart would put a ditch here, very similar uh, to the ditch that, uh, that Rochester, New York filled in and turned into uh, a boulevard in the last couple of years. Yeah. And, and the fact that they went the right way and we're preparing to go the wrong way uh, around the same time is just, it's just very, very sad, you know. I guess if there was any glimmer of hope that might be, is in fact what we just saw was the train going by here. Since this is the main downtown station, um, I would hope that, you know, at the very least, Cap Metro is fighting to try to maintain some level of, you know, service through that area during construction. And I hope pedestrian and bikes also have that same sort of grace in terms of, uh, uh, you know, during the construction. I, I hope so, yeah. but as someone who relies on Cap Metro, and I do love Cap Metro, uh, I question whether the people running Cap Metro use Cap Metro, mm -hmm. and if it's a big priority for them. Ah, that's that's another story. We'll we'll talk more about that later. Okay, let's uh, let's roll. Let's get away from all this noise. I mean, okay. let's, yeah. let's go. Yeah. Let's, yeah. let's go to a trail location. Okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we're rolling away from that very, very loud crossing, a, a very necessary and helpful crossing, especially for Kelsey. <laughs> but uh, uh, Adam, let's talk a little bit about, you know, this, this effort that is in place and the amount of support that you have been garnering. And, and talk a little bit about some of the characters who have signed on that are rather significant, that are really helping move this forward. Well, you know, when we started uh, over three years ago, we, we knew that there was a lot of work to be done in bringing the community together. I think for a long time, people had accepted I-35 as just a fact of life and everyone hates it, but everyone sort of accepts it. It will always be there. And so we, we have always been here to question that, you know, and, and, and raise the community's uh, spirits that, that something different could be done um, and you know we've very much taken the principled stand from the beginning that this highway is destructive and it's a it's a dividing uh, barrier to Austin and so that's just something we stand firm on that this highway is a problem for as long as it's here um, and I think that kind of that clarity uh, has has really engendered a lot of support you know, to us. I mean, we're, the, the strongest aspect of this campaign is that it's so deeply supported in the community. You know, thousands of people support us, uh, you know, dozens of businesses and organizations, new ones coming on board all the time. Um, and more recently, we've really started to see um, elected officials come on board from, you know, city council members to county commissioners to uh, state representatives and, and even, you know, U.S. 
representatives. And, and that's just amazing. And I think we're just seeing how the, the culture and the conversation is changing around this, this conversation. And it's because of the work of so many people to um, support our elected leaders in doing that. So it's, it's incredibly exciting and inspiring. Yeah, that's fantastic. Kelsey, um, from your perspective, you know, you, you've been involved for a couple of years now. I, you'd mentioned some of the early inspirations, um, but, you know, pardon me for saying, but it, it, it looks like you guys are actually kind of having fun doing this too. Is that true? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we get together at least once a month. We have a coffee social, we, so we meet up at a different coffee shop. We change neighborhood each time, so it's more convenient for different people. And these are some of my best friends now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So in other words, this is very important work, yes. but there's no reason why this can't create a sense of community and you know gives you something to rally around, it sounds like. Absolutely, I feel like I've met so many people through this movement and we instantly have a connection. Um, I see a lot of tweets and social media about how it's difficult to make friends after college. I think get involved in an activist campaign and you'll instantly have friends. Right. <laughs> that's, a, that's a good point actually. <laughs> Folks might be wondering why did we go this particular route? Um, why did we go this particular route, Adam? Navasota is a is a really nice street for getting around. It's narrow, you know, and I think narrow streets are so important to cities. Um, they they make it easier for neighbors to connect with each other. They slow everything down. Uh, they're more intimate. Uh, they're more walkable, and uh, you know it's extremely important uh, when we create new streets to uh, try and make as many of them as possible narrow and uh, the, the streets that we do have to, you know, find ways to narrow them, um, you know, using uh, other, other methods that just slow everything down because uh, fast traffic is really a, um, a social fabric killer um, in, a, in a city, um, not to mention, you know, a, a more dangerous environment. So uh, this is, Navasota is one of the relatively few north-south narrow streets in East Austin. And we're gonna go through this even though it says do not enter. Bikes accepted. <laughs> this is, I make this crossing at least once a day. So this is like my, yeah, the only thing about this crossing is you have to cross it without a light, but that's where you have reflexes. You know, and this is just like, when you think about it, it's, it's amazing that you have to make these decisions in modern life where a, a wrong reflex crossing a road could seriously injure or kill you. Oh, look at this, of course. Yay! The traffic is wonderful. I literally waited <laughs> like three minutes last time I came to your house. <laughs> really? <laughs> so we've done a lot of canvassing in this neighborhood and I was pretty new to canvassing when I started volunteering with Rethink 35. But what I've learned is there's very few people that once they understand that traffic is going to get worse, that the noise is going to be worse, the safety is going to be worse, um, very few people who are not on board with us. Now, Kelsey, you, you said something rather controversial there. Oh no. You said that traffic is going to get worse. How could it possibly be that traffic is going to be worse? We're going to be adding lanes, aren't we? We are going to be adding lanes. And when you're in a car on a highway stuck in traffic, you, ha you might have this feeling like, oh, if you could just add one more lane, then I could get around this traffic and I could be free. Uh, but what we've seen historically, and our major example is the Katy Freeway in Houston, when you add lanes, you induce demand. So more people are incentivized to drive and traffic just fills up again. It was 40% worse after Katy Freeway expanded to 26 lanes. Yeah, yeah. And you, we, we, we know that this is a, a proven concept in induced demand. It's, it's based on the Jevons paradox. And uh, I like to you know, point out to, to folks that we can use induced demand to 
to our benefit, hey, there yeah. I am on camera, we can use this to our benefit too, because if we build more lanes for walking and biking and safer environments, we can induce more people to do that too. So it's, it's really human nature, it's human behavior. And so if we make it easier for people to drive, then more people in fact will drive. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things that we're, we're trying to point out. And it's not like we're saying we're anti-car necessarily, it's just that we're anti-car dependence. We want to create environments that are safe for people to be able to get around. Exactly. For far so many people, the car is the best option and often the only option. Right. So we just want more options. That's it. It's yeah. an induced demand is a very empowering concept because it basically means you you get what you build for. And so what kind of world do we want to live in? I mean, I think that's a very basic question. Uh, even even people who who, uh, you know, aren't against highways or highway expansions. I, I don't think many people consider them pleasant environments. And um, what kind of world do we want to live in? We could live in a world where we can get on a train that glides you know, peacefully along and, and have a wonderful commute to where we're going, or we can be in these very, very <laughs> dreary, depressing environments that no one, you know, you don't see anyone hanging out next to I-35 who's having a good time. Um, and, and we don't have to have that. We really, we what really do you, don't. What do you mean we don't have to have that? I mean, I-35 is there, it's already terrible. What's, what's the future hold? I mean, what is the alternative? Well, you know, we, we've really seen that highways are not an effective uh, mass mobility solution um, because they, uh, they are centered around, let's see here, I guess we could go that way, left and then right. They're, a, they're an automobile centric solution. And the problem with cars is, is that they, the automobile is the most space inefficient form of transportation ever created. And so it just doesn't scale up very well, uh, as opposed to public transportation, uh, which, which does scale up it, basically infinitely. You know, if, if your train or your bus gets full, just run another train or bus. And uh, it's just a much better way to, to move people. So uh, there, there's just no good argument um, in, in, any, in any way for there being a highway through town. It doesn't move people well and it, it's, its side effects are so uh, profound uh, that it, it's just a, a terrible, terrible thing to do to a city. And it, it's, it's, it's true, you know, council member um, Zoe Kadri said at, a, at our I-35 press conference recently, this I-35 is one of the greatest mistakes in our city's history. And he's right. Yeah. And you mentioned, you know, the, the power of transit. And, and I like to always remind folks that the, really the, the true empowerment of transit is being able to make sure that you have a truly walkable and bikeable environment so that transit can actually exist in North America. Because quite frankly, our distances are, are greater than what you typically see in a, in a you know, compact, dense European environment. And so being able to make that last mile, two miles, three miles happen really is dependent on having uh, a truly bikeable, you know, high comfort bike network. Absolutely. I mean, th this is all connected. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, we have a lot of work to do, but Austin has been making progress in, uh, you know, in the last 10, 15 years, especially with some just incredibly um, safe, pleasant, useful uh, bike infrastructure and pedestrian infrastructure. And, you know, biking around Austin now is a radically different experience to what it was um, even five years ago. And, uh, you know, that, 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 would, that bodes well for the transit improvements we're making here in Austin. Um, and it, it bodes well for doing something other than a highway expansion. And I think that's something that a lot of people are picking up on, that a highway expansion is, is diametrically opposed to everything else that Austin is trying to do. Everything else that we're spending billions, and, uh, billions of dollars on is being, uh, you know, contravened by this highway expansion. It's just, it's just not who we are anymore. Um, 
and we have this disconnect between you know tech start which is very much about inducing more driving and encouraging more driving and the rest of us <laughs> okay so now we are actually down on the butler hike and bike trail and uh you know we can swing around here if i go like this you can see behind me there we've got lots of folks coming and going this is a critical activity asset for the city um, talk a little bit about the impacts that is, you know, really are, are going to happen to this trail. Kelsey, you had actually posted some stuff on that. Uh, why don't you fill us in? What do you, what have you heard is going to happen to this trail during construction? Textot is going to take over the part of the trail right under the highway for at least six years. And so for six years, this is going to be completely disrupted. Um, they're going to rebuild part of the trail on the water, I believe. Um, but as far as this crossing, there is a bike lane pedestrian crossing up here. Again, I don't know what it's going to look like. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that, do you get the sense? You, you've been, you both have been, you know, communicating with the community. Does the community understand what this construction period is going to be like? <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's amazing how many people know about this project and, and are upset about this project. And it's amazing how many people don't know about this project. And these are, these are changes that are going to profoundly influence people's lives. I mean, let's, we, let's not even talk about the, the long-term climate change and, and pollution impacts, just the daily impacts on people's lives of 10 years of construction, no trail here for many years. Um, it, it's yeah, it's going to be really, really bad. And at the end of it, all for something that's going to make people's lives worse for right. decades to come. I mean, kids who are being born today are going to live with this for the next 60, 70 years of their lives, if it gets built. Right, yeah. We haven't talked about the alternative. Part of the Rethink movement has really been that, guys, there's a viable alternative and it's already built. If you go to the SH-130 website, you'll see in big text, what does it say? The most efficient way around Austin, is that what it says? The viable alternative to I-35. Anyway, they're making the case that people should use SH-130 to go around. However, it's a toll road. So if I-35 is free and you're short on money, you're gonna take I-35, creating more traffic. There's, uh, yeah, so Rethink 35 is not just a, we shouldn't do something. It's not just a, an oppositional movement. And we, we really have, uh, you know, alternatives that are very, very promising for Austin. And, and the alternatives uh, that we've been looking at are really grounded in the experiences that other cities have had. Um, and, you know, one, one example we want to see really studied, which we've been highlighting is that it's, it's very common in a lot of cities for the highway to go around the center of town, not through the center of town. And in fact, I-35 does that very thing in at least 14 other Texas towns and cities. It goes around the central business district, not through it. So we should really be looking at, at that. And if that is a viable option, then we don't need another interstate highway going through town and that can be repurposed as a, as a boulevard where, with you know, excellent public transportation that would move two to three times the number of people that I-35 does today uh, with more housing, more green space, uh, you know, tree, tree lined streets, um, crossings at every street. Uh, we would be looking at something that would be a, a major uh, transportation, environmental, economic, equitable win for this city. Um, and this, this isn't entirely a speculative idea. This, is, this has been done in this country. Yeah. You use that term again, boulevard, <laughs> but you're clearly not talking about the, uh, the text dot vi vision of what a boulevard is. <laughs> what, 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 what are you imagining? What is a people-oriented, city-friendly boulevard? What, is it, what would you imagine that to be? Well, the boulevard that we could create through Austin where I-35 today is, is, is really something that the community should be, uh, be co-creating together. 
Uh, but there's many examples um, that, that we have. Um, even in Austin, you know, Congress Avenue um, is, is a beautiful boulevard for much of its stretch. Uh, but certainly across the country, we have boulevards um, everywhere. And then of course, in other countries, we have uh, boulevards too. A lot of people uh, you know, might think of, of some of the Spanish boulevards, the Barcelona boulevards. Uh, there's, there's so many examples. Um, every country has them, this country has them too. Uh, so it's a, it's a time-tested um, design. Uh, it's great uh, for, you know, for, for livability, for the economy, for housing, and uh, we could have that right here. Talk a little bit about the history of what that future boulevard could be or was. I mean, it actually was an avenue, a boulevard. So before I-35 was built in, uh, was finished in 1962, before that it was East Avenue. And uh, that was actually a community gathering space for the community surrounding it. And we have beautiful uh, photos from the past of, of, you know, graduation ceremonies from Houston Tillerson happening. Uh, it was a it was a wide, uh, grassy median where where things could happen, where where people got together and 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 ate and celebrated and uh, lived lives. And uh, you know there are still people around today who remember those days, those times. And uh, you know that's really something that can inspire us um, to think about. Kind of going back to something that is a place where where things happen again. Now, Kelsey, you you say you actually work close to uh, to, to IH thirty five, um, and 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 that brings up a good point. There's there's communities uh, along this stretch. You know, we're just talking about Eastern Avenue. There it was uh, you know part of a community. There's businesses along this stretch that you know predated I uh, I thirty five and are there now that are going to be impacted. T talk a little bit about from your perspective, because it's kind of a little bit in your hood in the sense that you work in that area. There's businesses that are going to be impacted, correct? Yes, there's over 150 businesses along I-35 that will be impacted. And I'm thinking to my normal day at the office, we don't really go up and down the frontage road because it's so unpleasant. It's already unpleasant at however many lanes there are now. There's nowhere for you to stop and have a coffee. Um, and so it's only going to get worse. It's going to take even more space away from us and more space for that community. Yeah. Adam, do you have the numbers off the top of your head? How many residences and businesses and a number of acres are gonna be impacted by this widening if this disastrous thing happens? Which it's, it's a, not, because you're gonna stop it. <laughs> it's, the, the impact is gonna be over 120 homes and businesses. Um, actually, is it didn't, it, I think it might have gone up to 140 because there was a 20 unit. The apartments. The apartments, yes. Counted. The the 120 is the old number, right? Yeah. So let me say that again. It's, it's, if I-35 were expanded, it would uh, lead to the demolition of roughly 140 homes and businesses. Uh, that is a real impact to people's lives, a major impact. And we're, we're talking about places like Escolita del Alma Preschool, which is a, a extremely important school for so many families. Uh, so the, the level of disruption this would cause just to the homes and businesses along I-35 would be considerable, not to mention the, you know, the construction impacts as well. And I, and you know, we, we always say it would be 10 years of, of hell for a lifetime of misery once the highway is built. It's, 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 you know, this, <laughs> this highway is, is a, is a millstone around all of our necks every single day. I live three blocks from this, from this highway. I can hear it in bed. You know, it is a daily nuisance. Uh, it's not just uh, dangerous, it's also profoundly unpleasant. Um, everything around it withers in its wake. Yeah, Kelsey, final words. Final words of wisdom as uh, a young activist that has got inspired by this. Yeah, I think, um 
I think in 2020, which is right before I got involved, I had all of this dread and this despair, especially around climate change and wanting to make the city a better place. And the only thing that has really got me out of that is trying to get involved. And I had no idea what I was doing. So I think that if you want to get out of that despair, do something. Action is the solution and just be persistent. Even if you have, or you think you have no skills related to the movement, if you have the passion to do it, that's all you need. Great, thank you very much. I'm gonna let you get to work. Okay. Adam, you and I, we are gonna go look at some of these uh, homes and businesses that are going to be impacted. Okay, okay. wow, all right. Okay, right. let's go. Kelsey is is just been so amazing in this, uh, to this movement. I mean, so many people have come to this through the, through the projection that she has given to this movement, the, the voice on social media and in, in, in person. And um, it's just, you know, the, the family has come together partly because of her work and, and we're all family in this. And this, this movement can't survive without that, without the personal connections between people. So. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Aww. And, and a huge high five to Kelsey too, because she is one of my Active Towns ambassadors. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay, okay bye get to work. All, All right, bye. see Thank you soon. You. Rethink 35 and Friends held a press conference um, a couple of weeks ago to respond to TechStot's uh, quote unquote final announcements for its plans over I 35. And. Uh, it, it was really quite a quite an experience uh, at that press conference, and you know we've had many kind of turning moments in this uh, in this movement where it felt like we kind of broke through into a new um, to a new level, and it, this press conference was yet another point at which it felt like we broke through, and I think what. What people saw that day was the broadest range of community voices that have yet been seen on this issue, um, and and uh, the 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 level of uh, of candor and passion from elected leaders was higher than it's ever been, and you know we're seeing this kind of raising of of vibrations around this this project. Um, and that was just an amazing moment. You know, I don't think any of us expected that to happen. I think that, you know, this, this whole conversation around I-35 and around highways is really a conversation about people. And a highway expansion is really a failure by people, of people. And the success of Rethink 35 as a movement and this, you know, t cultural turning around we're seeing about highways from, you know, across the country and, and even all over the world, you know, in, in countries like Germany and, and many others. Uh, recently, we've seen, you know, enormous backlash against highways and highway expansions. And that is really a triumph of people. It's a triumph of vision, of, of persistence, uh, of dedication, of, of, of moral clarity. And it's, it's just an amazing thing to, to be involved with. And I, I just think anyone who really wants to be part of something that will lift their spirits and, and give them a sense that we can really make a difference should, should come forward and get involved. What got me inspired to, to get involved with Rethink 35 and fight this highway expansion is really uh, the vision of a, of a better world. This, I live three blocks from this highway, so I viscerally feel the, the desolation that this highway has caused, that any highway through a city center causes. So literally, this is impacting you daily. I, I, I experience and am impacted by this highway every single day. Uh, it is a one of, the, one of the most profound acts of violence that can be visited on a city is to put a highway through it. It is a, it is a toxic, toxic environment. And, and having seen so many city centers that don't have this, that have 
beautiful environments that, that people love. Uh, I've, I've just realized we can have that here too. We don't have to settle for this anymore. And we can change this. This, this whole environment could be completely different. I mean, this could be a place right where we are right now. This could be a place where people are sitting outside a cafe, enjoying the good life as, as the regional trail from Sa a regional train from San Antonio rolls through and people bike along slowly. People walk down the street, walking the dog. People relax under shade. All these things could happen right here. Thousands of, of, of people and families living in housing right above where we are right now. This, this could be the reality. We just have to push for it. And it brings up the point too. I mean, we're really only a block or so away from the, the lake. This is transforming this, this dismal environment into something that is a positive contribution for, for all people is, uh, is one of the biggest opportunities in all of Texas to make a difference. Uh, and we are right, right here on this doorstep right now. I mean, to just look at this, how much better it could be. And so, you know, we don't need to let TechStot set the terms of the discussion here. This is not just about uh, fighting a terrible proposal. This is something that we can come, come together around with, with great joy and inspiration and, and push for this. And sometimes where you know, the, the, the seemingly invincible fortress looks invincible the moment before it collapses. Uh, we could be closer than we think to, to accomplishing something like that. Uh, because I think culturally, the kind, of, the kind of cultural environment that produced these kind of highways is, is ending. And people are waking up to the central role that highways play, take in uh, highways, uh, the central role that highways um, play in fighting climate change, in creating more housing, in making cities more beautiful, more walkable, more bikeable. This is a fight we have to fight. I pulled over here so we could like really let this sink in. We are, you know, here right on uh, River Street and Holly Street, San Marco Street. And literally this is a 20 mile per hour zone because that's a school right there. I mean, how, how idiotic is that? We, we literally have a school within a stone's throw distance of an interstate, a major interstate. The, it's, it's exactly right. There are, we can see children right here on, in this, on this running track in this, in this park right here. Uh, somebody could throw a stone from right there and hit the highway. And we know that the effects of, of highways, the pollution impacts are especially pronounced within uh, 500 meters of, of a highway. Yeah. Uh, that's where you get disproportionate impacts on uh, childhood asthma, um, on heart conditions, even, um, even diseases like Alzheimer's are worsened by highways. And we have a school right next to the highway and to your point i mean it, it's not it's not just about internal combustion in, engines i mean we, even if we in, in completely electrify the fleet having the the interstate right here next to this school means they are continually being exposed to the ultra fine particulate matter coming off of tires and brake pads and and there's and, and this is one of the worst environments for that because you have many heavy trucks, heavy SUVs, heavy vehicles of all sorts. And at the same time, you're gonna have, you know, lots and lots of braking and, uh, you know, because it's gonna be stop and go, you just know it is. And so that's not gonna go away. Absolutely, there, there, is, no, there is no winning scenario with more cars going through Austin. And let's just remind ourselves, we're talking about an additional 
100,000 cars a day going through Austin. And uh, whether it's an electric vehicle or a combustion engine, the pollution impacts will be tremendous. Uh, the government, the federal government is actually tightening standards on particulate matter, the, the, the particles that get ground down off of tires. And uh, in, increasingly it's being understood that there's no safe level of exposure to these particulate matters. It's, the problem is, is cars. And we can certainly you know, anticipate long into the future there will always be a need for some level of driving. Uh, but we're seeing increasingly that a majority of people are sick and tired of driving. Uh, this, is a, this is a transportation paradigm that has failed, um, certainly as a form of mass transportation. Uh, people have traveled uh, around the country, around the world. They've seen other systems. Uh, nobody who's experienced a great public transportation system comes back and, and wants this. And, and we are, you know, we've got a house right behind us here. Uh, we've got houses right across the street here. And again, as we were mentioning, the school right here. Uh, do you know if the school is threatened by this expansion, if this expansion goes through? The, the school is, uh, I think, going to be here after if the expansion were to happen. Uh, but the highway will be certainly bringing uh, thousands and thousands of additional cars through every day as a result of the expansion, not to mention the construction impacts, all that dust and pollution kicked up during the construction. So the, the air pollution impacts on this school will be, uh, will be pronounced. Yeah, and I'm, and I'm wondering too, I, don't, I haven't studied the map, but I'm wondering if some of these homes are at risk right along the frontage road here. And if so, then guess what? That interstate's gonna be literally right on the front doorstep. Uh, in other words, it's gonna encroach even closer. Yeah, there, there will be uh, some of the buildings um, in this area right around here will be destroyed by the expansion too. And that's often overlooked, uh, but it's gonna happen here as well. And, uh, and the, the, the homes and businesses and schools that won't be removed will be slightly closer to the highway and they will have worse air pollution for many decades to come. Uh, but it's not inevitable. And one of the wonderful things that we're seeing um, in this movement is uh, giving, the people, giving people the chance to speak out, whether they're residents, business owners, uh, elected officials and others. Uh, people are taking that opportunity to speak out and we're seeing this rising chorus that's happening here locally in Austin. And at the same time, we're seeing that across the country, uh, that these choruses against highways and highway expansions are happening from coast to coast and everywhere in between. And across the world. This is happening everywhere. People are waking up to the central role that, that highways play in our futures. We have to address them. And uh, now is the time. You know, this, is, this, this challenge has been handed to us. It's not up to someone in the future anymore. It's not up, it's not up to people who are going to be born uh, now or in the future to deal with this. This is up to us who are here right now. This is our gift. To the future, whatever we bequeath to them, and uh, and we can give them something incredible. Uh, I truly, truly believe uh, that the worst legacies of the 20th century will be dealt in the coming years by people who have woken up finally uh, to these challenges. There's so many people involved in this movement, and more coming forward all the time. Uh, so many unsung heroes in this and those people give their time you know every day every week um, persistently it's just I, I never I don't think I ever thought something like this uh, that I would be a part of something like this I mean this is truly one of the great honors of my life um, and I, I've made so many friends through this movement and the the camaraderie and the, the, the family that's, that's built around this has just been a, a, a uh, unparalleled joy in, in my life. 
Uh, and I think, yeah, you know, in an era as well where we're facing, you know, a loneliness epidemic, an, a, a uh, isolation, uh, there is no one involved with this movement, I think, who's having that experience because they found a, a place where, where friendship is just abundant. So I want to give a I, I want to give a shout out to everyone who's involved with the movement. Uh, there's so many people, uh, and I also want to give a shout out to our you know elected leaders uh, who have really uh, spoken up around this this project, and they're not taking the easy option to just kind of duck it and be quiet about it, but they're speaking out um, despite in some cases threats, you know that threats are, are being made to our uh, leaders, um, uh, but they still continue to courageously speak out because they understand the, the, the gravity of this project and the impact it will have for generations. Um, we've just seen in the past couple of weeks, uh, you know, elected leaders at the state and national level come out uh, against expanding I-35. Um, we have a lot of leaders still who need to speak up. Um, there is still too much silence uh, around this, this project and we need our electeds. Uh, they play a unique role, as do the community, um, and everyone needs to speak out. It, it sounds like, too, we've got some leaders that are, you know, unfortunately, on board with us and are actually advocating for it. There are a few leaders who I think are stuck in the old paradigm. Uh, who are who are backing this project? Uh, there, are, there's a, la a, a larger number who are opposing the project, and then there's uh, you know too many who are trying to duck it out and take the easy way out and stay quiet about it. Uh, we, you know, it's it's really those leaders we need to step up. They need to understand that this will impact countless, countless people for many decades to come, potentially the best part of a hundred years. And you know, we're at this tipping point now with climate change. We've we had this, we've just gone through this hellish summer of, of unparalleled heat in Austin. Um, and we've seen this, you know, across the US, across the country, uh, these these stunning weather events uh, that we have not seen before. This is an unprecedented moment and we're at a tipping point where the decisions we make right now will, will impact all life on Earth for hundreds and thousands of years. Uh, there, there is no choice but to fight this highway expansion. If not now, when? If not who? Us. That was our that was our original mascot, the frog. Yeah, I remember that one. The Frogger game. Yeah. Adam, thank you so very much. It's been such a joy and honor and pleasure connecting you with you once again. Uh, I was kind of surprised that you didn't uh, come up and you know, show up as a Captain Crap Land use, but... <laughs> he's a relative of mine, uh, you know, uh, he's out there somewhere, I'm sure, in some distant uh, asphalt uh, hellhole. Uh, for whatever perverse love he has of those environments. Uh, I'm sure we'll see him again one day. Hey, thank you all so much for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed this special ride along episode with Kelsey and Adam with Rethink 35. And if you did, please give it a thumbs up, <laughs> leave a comment down below and share it with a friend. And please be sure to check out the efforts of Rethink 35. Uh, you may be fighting a freeway of your own in your own community, in your own neighborhood. Uh, please know that there are plenty of resources out there. So be a part of the freeway fighters. And again, sending a huge thank you out to all my Active Towns ambassadors supporting the channel on Patreon, Buy Me A Coffee, YouTube Super Thanks, as well as making contributions to the nonprofit and purchasing things from the Active Towns store. Every little bit adds up and it's much appreciated. Thank you all so much.